configurable with real-time data, and we're going to drill down to the source transaction. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So I'm just going to toggle over to impact. And normally what I would do is I would just make sure that people can uh, see my screen because a lot of times there's a little bit of a delay. So I always want to make sure that people can see my screen. And I use the uh, first two, three minutes of my presentation to go through the user experience. Now, I don't know how many of you are using the new user interface. I'm still getting used to it myself. So um, I'm trying to use it as much as possible. If you have not flipped over and started using it, you need to because it's going to take some getting used to and there's some things that are different. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. Last update I had, March, is the drop dead date uh, when you're not going to have a choice. But you'll notice up here at the top you've got on or off. In some of my demos now, I'm showing both, but I'm trying my best to stay in the new one because that's what people will be delivered is the new user interface. They're still making some enhancements to it, so it's not totally in concrete yet. So that was a little bit outside of world, but back to the user experience. I do make the assumption that there are some people who have not seen impact. When you open up to this dashboard, there's a lot of information. So for the AD people, uh, ADT people in the room today who have not seen impact, let me cover a few minutes of the user experience and explain some of the things that you're seeing here on the screen. So first of all, I have logged in today through a secure login as the controller, and I have permissions running in the background that allow me permission into specific modules or applications within the solution. I'm pretty much a super user, so I've got everything turned on and I can access it accordingly. I've also have one instance of impact that I'm managing multiple companies in. So when I hover over this drop down, you see that I am managing four companies. ADT's companies would all be listed here and very easy for you to add an additional company, it takes less than a minute to do that. And your security can also be restricted into these certain companies as well. No more logging in, logging out like you did in QuickBooks. You'll be able to key a transaction to whatever entities or companies you have access to. And by the way, entity and company are interchangeable to me. You'll hear me use them interchangeably. They are the same. Now, we've got four companies. We've got our control user. We've got a toolbar up here with our different applications. Uh, for real estate purposes, I can uh, use my arrow to, to move over across those different applications. Within this toolbar now, uh, I can select any one of these applications. As I've selected dashboards here, it will uh, paint that screen for me. But what you see on the left-hand side is your menu structure. So now you're going to be able to look at everything that's under dashboards, and it's divided up into some sections here. And once you determine what you go to most frequently, you can then save that as one of your favorites. So gold starring anything creates a favorite link, and that way you have a very short menu to use with all of your favorites. The all menu stays there regardless, so you can always get to those other options, but this gives you a quick way to navigate into a particular activity, report, or task. Each one of our applications has a process map. I like to show this because this is comforting to people. It's got the pictures, it's got the icons, and in many cases it has a best practice defined. If we look in purchasing, this is one that has a little bit more depth to it, uh, a process that we're going to see today where we start with a purchase requisition, 
we're going to get that approved and then we're going to convert it into a purchase order, go through a receiving step, step and then uh, through creating a vendor invoice. This is a best business practice that we deliver, and we show it to you here in pictorial format. So I can click on any of these icons the same way that I can click on the uh, task from the favorites menu. It will take me right into that place in the software. So easy for you to navigate, very consistent, very clean looking, and again, you have the ability to use the favorites to streamline those menus that you want to travel from. So let's come back to the dashboard. And I'm going to be mostly out of role here because I want you to make sure and know what you should show when you show a dashboard. I'm going to say that most of you have either heard this at the BBC last spring, you heard it um, maybe through some partner office hours, uh, maybe you've heard it through your um, partner meeting, your monthly uh, partner call. I'm, I'm going to say you probably had five or six different times that you could have heard it, but it's something that we call demo goals, and Aaron Harris is the one that coined that phrase, and he's the one that has come up with some things that he says we should always show when we show impact. So I'm going to touch on some of those today so that you get an idea of where they are on my dashboard. There are some that may need to be added to your dashboard, so that's why I mention it. So the first thing is, remember I am managing four companies in this one instance of impact. So when I look at this controller dashboard, I am looking at a consolidated view. And one of the things that you know, you see up here at the very top are these boxes, and these boxes are key performance indicators. I would like to refer to them as quick business insights. So if I'm the controller, what's important to me in my role that I need to, to have quick insight to? I want to look at revenue. I want to look at my expenses. I may want to look at my income. So whatever I, is important to me in my role, that's what I want to have on my dashboard. And you'll notice that I have several dashboards that I have flagged as my favorites. And these dashboards, you can create as many of them as you choose to. They can be permissioned, and they can also be duplicated. They are designed for a business user to create and maintain. They are not something that an IT person has to do for you. So when I look at this consolidated view, I'm looking at all of the income and the revenue across all four companies. If I'm interested in knowing more about this Quick Business Insight, I can drill into this information and I can see where it's coming from. So now when I look at it, I can see that the um, sales for November were 43,600 and the sales for December are 66.4. So I can compare this to a different period or to a different quarter. That's part of how I set up that performance card. If I want to know more about where that $66,000 is coming from, I can choose any of these invoices. These are sales invoices because I'm looking at revenue. And I can drill in to that data so that I can see that invoice and know everything about it. Now, this is the invoice, and some important feature here is the fact that I have all this high-level information at the top. I can see that it's due in 30 days. They've, they've made a partial payment. I can drill back to that partial payment. I also can see what account I have posted the revenue to. So I can see that this is a surveillance type of sale. In this environment, I've used product category, product line to segregate my sales. I also can take this to the next level, which is the source transaction. So by clicking on that sales invoice, I now can get to what individual items or items were sold out of what warehouse, what location and department, 
how many of them, the price, and in this case, I've also tagged them to the employee and the class. Now, this is a good place to stop, and while you're on this line, say, you might notice that there's several pieces of information here that are tagged to this transaction. So starting over here with item, warehouse, location, department, these are what we call dimensions, and dimensions are a key differentiator. These dimensions help tell the story of the transaction. They also allow me to create what's called dimensionalized data. Creating dimensionalized data gives me the ability to filter at report execution time by one or more of the dimensions. Now, at this point, you can go a little bit further and you can say, with the core applications, you're going to have seven predefined dimensions. Based on your subscriptions, you have the ability to turn on or activate three more. So you have a total of 10 predefined dimensions. In addition to that, you have the ability to define what we call user-defined dimensions, and that's an unlimited number. So it kind of depends on how comfortable you are, how far you want to go with that. But this is a good way for you to introduce those dimensions and to show them how that dimensionalized data gets created. We're tagging the transaction with the dimension, creating dimensionalized data that can then be filtered on at report execution time. So getting out of this and coming back, we're going to come back to our dashboard. So this is where we started. We started with this revenue business insight. We drilled to the source transaction, which was an invoice. We can do the same thing with our expenses. So if you choose G&A instead of choosing revenue, you can do the same thing. You can do the same talk track. The top track here that I use, and I'm not saying that you have to show both, pick one. If you choose this one, I choose this $5,900. And the reason I choose this is because I know this is one invoice that came in from Midtown Property for um, a bill that I want to spread across all four companies. So that gives me another top track, another benefit to a multi-entity environment. So here's the invoice, the vendor invoice from Midtown. It's due in 17 days for $5,900. And what you'll notice down here is that I've taken that $5,900 and I have expensed it across my different companies. Now, doing that will allow me to just enter this invoice once. I didn't enter it four times. I entered it one time, and each company is getting their portion of the expense. One of the other ways that Intax can help you automate is by using an allocation template. So let's just say that this $1,750, you want to take that and expense it across all of your locations. Using an allocation rule, and these are rules that you set up, I now can take this $1,750. Intax will do the work for me, and it will split that 1750 based on my rule, and in my case, it's by location and department, and it's an even split. So now I don't have to do that manually. Intax is doing that for me. Those are called allocation templates. So that's another way for you to show that drill down. So if you choose to go the expense route, that's the top track that you can use there. Once I've gone through uh, one of these up here, I mentioned this one here, the sales by square foot, and I say this is a different type of business insight. This is where we're looking at both financial and non-financial data, and in many cases, you're looking at this, but you don't really have a way to incorporate this into your decision making. So for ADT, tie it back to your prospect. For ADT, we're looking at square feet, and we're doing that based on warehouse space. 
So each one of your companies has warehouse space. We set up square foot as a statistical account. We then entered a statistical journal entry to accommodate the entire square footage across all warehouses. And then we created a report that supports the sales for square foot. So let's take a look at that report. It's right here on my dashboard. So here's the report. Here's the financial information. Here's my square foot, which is my stat account. And my statistical journal entry represents 156,100 square feet, total square feet across all warehouses. Then I, I've done the computation within the financial report, because I created this with the financial report writer, to, sh to show me the sale of square foot, broken out month by month, so that I can do the look back and I can see how I am tracking over a 12-month period. And I can also see the spark line, which gives me the trend. Now, this is something that, that has to be relevant. So in ADT's case, warehouse space is relevant. Some of the space they lease, some of it they own. The point is it gives them a view of the revenue that's going through each one of their warehouses. So that's how I position these KPIs. The second piece that you need to do is you need to talk about these filters up here. So remember I said that you're looking at all of the companies consolidated from this dashboard. But let's just say that I only want to look at Texas. If I apply that filter, it's going to repaint this dashboard, and now you're only going to see the data as it relates to this one company. So being the controller, that's something that I may want to do. If I am the manager or the controller or the executive for the Texas company, I may have this dashboard and this view only. I may not be able to see anybody else. I can only see my particular company or entity. And there's multiple ways that you could do that. You could set the permissions here. You could only give them access to a certain company here. You can uh, take this dashboard and make it view only so that they can only look at their company. They can't even change anything on the dashboard. So lots of choices with how you set this up. But now you, you, know, you can immediately see I'm looking at Texas because I see sales per square foot. And it's really changed. The other place that it's changed is here on the income segment. So the income statement now is going to show me the locations that roll up to the Texas company. So Austin, Dallas, and then a Texas location that roll up to the Texas company. So this is another way that you know that you're looking at just one of those companies. So let's come back, and, and uh, by the way, you can talk about the other filters here. Date is another one you can turn on. Uh, you could be looking at this for just a single customer if you chose to. Those filters are behind this dashboard setting. So that's how you set those filters up. So you definitely want to show that so that people can um, see the difference between looking at the entire footprint and looking at just one of the locations. So coming back to the dashboard, I'll pick up the pace a little bit, but these are all important things that I want you to make sure that you get. And you also can drive most of your presentation from the dashboard without having to get into the transaction level. And that's part of what you have to work on to do because it's, a, it's probably a different way for you to show software than you've shown it in the past. So let's take a look at the income statement. And this is the one for all companies. A couple of things I've done here. I've got all four companies side by side. That was intentional. I did that in the formatting. I also turned on conditional shading. So I set up a rule that said any dollar amount that is equal to zero, I want you to flag it in red. So another way to have quick business insights. I also point out that you can 
drill into this data the same way you shot, saw me drill in from the key performance indicators. So you don't need to do it again. But what you can point out is the fact that this is dropping me into a GL report, which is going to show me a couple things. It's going to show me what department this transaction was linked to and some of the other pertin pertinent information about the transaction. It's also going to show me which journal this was posted in, and it might be worth mentioning that we are in multi-journal system. So we're multi-book, multi-journal, multi-company, multi-currency, we're multi-everything. The other piece is I somewhere on the line mentioned, you see all these buttons up here. As I'm going through today, you're going to see them. Everything can be viewed. It can be printed. You might want to push it out to your dashboard. You may even want to export it out to Excel. So I like to point those out because that way they know that you know, they've got options when they pull a report up as to how they want to see it or deploy it. At this point, it's a great place for you to show that dimensionalized data and that filtering. So let's come up and take this report and let's filter this report by a couple of those dimensions. So let's take that income statement, let's filter it down to just Texas, and let's filter it to a specific item. And once we do that, it's going to repaint that report based on the criteria that we've asked it to filter. So here it is, and if I call up any of these transactions, you're going to find that they meet that criteria. So if I look at this $80,000, it would be something in the Texas location, and it would be for that 21052 surveillance item that I filtered against. Now, I can come in here and I can stay in this filtering mode as long as I choose to. Other filters might include other dimensions. It might also include an as of date. So this is how you create one report and you're able to slice and dice it. This report as well was created with the financial report writer. Another report that shows some great visual indicators is this GNA expenses actual versus budget. This is one that is going to show you how you can have your actuals coming in via your transactions that you're keying. You can pull in a budget, and that budget came right in from intact. And then again, the visual indicators here with the variance. Another report created with the financial report writer. One of the things that I always show is let's take a little bit different view of one of the financial reports. Let's say that today I'm looking at this report and it's showing me my sales broken out by product category. But what if, as the controller, I wanted to know more about the individual items that had been sold? From the dashboard, I can edit this report. I can come in and I can change how I am filtering the data. And I do this pretty quickly. I don't go into a lot of details because I don't want to train someone. But I just tell them I'm going to filter by item. And now when you look at this report, remember this is the income statement. It's now showing me the individual items that I sold instead of my sales by product category. Just by flipping the detail setting, and remember I did that from the dashboard. So this gives them the ability to, uh, to, to really understand how easy it is without you getting into the, the deep, dark, you know, how do I create a report? Let me move this little guy over here. It's right in my way here. There we go. All right. So now uh, you can get out of this report, cancel out of it. You haven't changed that filtering permanently. And you can come right back into your dashboard. One other piece I want to show on the dashboard is Intact Collaborate. Not part of your storyboard for ADT, 
However, you need to turn this on in your environment and you need to be able to show it in your real deal. So just make sure that you have a component on the dashboard for Collaborate. Make sure that you've got some transactions and conversations where you can tell the story of how you're self-documenting a transaction and you're putting that detail right at the transaction. You're communicating, it's the social media layer, and it takes about two minutes to set it up and it comes with the solution, it doesn't cost any extra. So just a few little pointers there, not necessarily for ADT, but good for you to have for your real deals. All right, one more thing about dashboards, and that is there's a couple of dashboards that I use in the storyboard. So one of them that I use, besides the controller dashboard, one of them that I use is um, the purchasing operations dashboard. And I see one that I haven't flagged as a favorite, so I'll go do that. So the purchasing one, I'm going to use this one in my procure to pay. That's how I'm going to finish up that segment. So I've got a purchasing dashboard created. I also created a workflow approval dashboard. This makes it real easy because now everything for Joanna Drake, who's my controller, everything comes to one dashboard. Just another way for you to not get stuck in your travels of going here, going there to do approval. You can put them all on one dashboard, it makes it real clean. Um, the other one that I should have flagged and I don't is the sales one. So I want to flag that one as a favorite because I use the sales management dashboard at the end of the customer service area that I talk about. I finish up with the sales management. Now, we talked about visibility from a dashboard perspective. Um, I refer to the report writer several times. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is I like to um, I like to go in and at least talk a little bit about the financial report writer without going too deep. So what you saw me go into with the income statement, that was a financial report that was created with our financial report writer. All reports are housed in the report center. There's 150 reports that are um, there when you implement. They're already created for you. About 30 of those are financial reports. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to be consistent. So I showed them the dashboard income statement. So that's the report that I want to point to here. So keep it consistent. Just note that any of the reports that you create can be copied, so they can be duplicated. Uh, you can also deploy them different ways. So deploying them means that you could uh, send them out via email, you can print them, you can push them out in a PDF format, you can export them. You can also schedule them with the intact scheduler with a start and end date, a frequency, and a delivery list. So, several ways for you to deploy and, uh, of course, be able to view and print these reports. I don't believe that you need to go any further here. If you choose to, I would tell you go to the edit area and talk to me about the rows and the columns. And the reason that I would talk about the rows is because this is where you're going to introduce account groups. And account groups are a great way to um, introduce that flex reporting, introduce that ease of creating financial reports. I would keep it very light here because most of the time you don't have enough time in your presentation to go very deep. You might open this up and get a lot of questions that take you down the rabbit hole. So again, I would focus on that dashboard. And, and utilizing the dashboard to show the power of reporting. All right, so that kind of takes care of visibility. Uh, once you're finished with a section, what I would suggest that you do is come back to this screen. So come back here 
do a quick, um, you know, what you saw, not did you see, but what you saw was financial reporting, visibility, we talked about financial data, we saw operational data being brought in, and we drilled down to the source transaction. So now let's go talk about what's going on in our customer service area. So today we know that you don't have a process that allows you to see everything in one place. You're entering data multiple times, and that's truly affected your customer satisfaction. So what we want to show you today is one point of entry. We want to show you a quick, automated, configurable process it's going to give you the efficiency and the productivity to answer those questions first time every time. So now let's come back to Intact. And here um, I would start with order entry. So I would start with the map. And this is a great way to start any conversation into a section. Let's go look at the overview map. And you know, today you're not using quotes. Uh, you could turn this off when you set up permissions uh, and activate it whenever you needed to, if you needed to. Uh, today, what you're doing is you're starting with a sales order. That sales order is then being fulfilled, and then accounting is creating a sales invoice. This process here, we've already done. We already have a process out here. Uh, however, we've got a, a customer on the line who's calling in about their sales order. So let's take a look at how we can utilize Intact to get that information. So one of the things that you might want to show is how to filter on any of these columns. So you're talking to the customer, they don't know their order number, they don't know anything but usually their name, maybe they know their PO number, you can use these columns to filter on to find the right sales order. When you find it, you then have the ability to look at that sales order and more importantly, any information that you need to answer is here, along with the history tab. And this is the tab that's going to be the most important to a CSR, because this history tab is going to track every step in the process. Now, what you can see here is this is a sales order that has come in, it's been shipped, and it's been invoiced. So if the customer is calling and saying, Linda, I need to add something to my sales order. When I look at the history tab, I can look and see that I can't add anything to this sales order because it's already been shipped and invoiced. What I can do is I can say, you know what, we've already shipped that out to you. So let's just go ahead and create another order and get whatever it is you need um, out the door as quick as possible. So let's just take this information. I'm just going to copy that over and create a new sales order. So for a CSR, we're going to make it quick, simple. You don't have to rekey a bunch of stuff. You can just copy this right over to another sales order. Maybe they're calling because they need a copy of something. So I can print or email from the screen. I can take care of that immediately while they're on the phone. So that's another thing that uh, is going to allow me to, to automate and, and really be efficient. If they're calling to ask if their order has been shipped, I now have the shipping information. I can say, yes, your order was shipped. In fact, um, it was shipped on the 14th today, and it was shipped via UPS. And uh, let me give you the UPS number, and it's right here. So now I have all that information. I know what was shipped, and I can give that to them while they're on the phone. The next piece of information that they might be calling about is the sales invoice. So again, have you invoiced me? Absolutely, and you know, the invoice is in the mail. Uh, it's going to be due on the 13th of January. Um, maybe they have a question about it, and if they have a question about it, you may need to enter something in Collaborate and send a message to Drew Jackson and ask him something about it internally through the system. And that, that conversation will be linked right to this particular transaction. Again, they want to print or email a copy of the invoice to them. Everything at your fingertips. This one screen, this history tab, is the key to everything that 
a customer service rep needs to know about a customer's questions while they have them on the phone. So you can cover all of that just by having this one sales order, run it through the whole process, and stay on that one order. Now, there's some other things that a customer might call in about, and that might be, you know, something about inventory. So um, they may want to know uh, how many you have of something, and um, that would come from a stock status report. So, uh, you know, one of the things that you might want to do is come in here to some of the reports, and you may want to flag some of those. That's not one that I have flagged. So, um, you know, you might want to come in here and say, I want to flag this item activity report, and that's going to allow me to see inventory transactions. So let's go look at that item activity report, and let's look at it for just one particular item. And we'll just go ahead and view that. <coughs> and so here, what you see is an item, and you see the different warehouses, and now you're able to see all of the quantities on hand with the warehouse information. So uh, with these transactions, you can drill in and you can see, you know, how that item is, is being shipped out, when you're expecting more in. So you have all of your uh, buckets up here, if you will, to show you how many are on order coming from purchasing, how many are reserved from sales order, and, and how many are on hand, which is what should be on the shelf in the warehouse. Um, there's another report here that um, I'm looking for, and I didn't see it, so let me see. Here we go. So the status one is probably a better report to work from, because this one, uh, the status report will consolidate everything into a smaller view. So let's do this one from that same item, and let's view it. So now, if they were calling in and saying, do you have, you know, 5,000 of these surveillance systems, you could say, oh, yes, we do. We have 5,000 in our main warehouse in Texas. So uh, this gives you that consolidated view, and then if you needed to, you could drill into the quantity available and you can see all that item activity. So drilling here takes you to that item activity, which is what we looked at first. So that's another reason that you may want to go in here and flag some of these as your favorites. The third thing that you might want to show is somebody calls in about their account. So you go to accounts receivable, you go to the AR ledger, and we choose our Texas Alarm Company as our customer, and let's do this for the current year, so we get quite a bit of data here. So now they're calling in about their account. They've got a question about their account, and you can hyperlink right into a transaction. From there, you could answer any questions. You could print or email them a copy of the invoice. So inventory, customer's account, and then the sales order, the shipping, and the invoice. And the other thing that I missed there was um, if, if they made a payment, um, you would be able to see their cash receipt information as well. When you look at that history tab against the sales invoice, you'll be able to see any payment details from cash receipts that has been made. So that's really what you want to show in your customer service area and make sure that you're tying that back to those customer service reps who need to answer those questions. Once you're done with that, then you're gonna come back to this screen. You're gonna go back through that quick synopsis of what you saw today was one place to enter all the information, whether it's in company 10 or 20 or 30. Uh, being able to enter that very quickly, it's configurable, uh, no rekeying of data. But more importantly, as those transactions are being posted, we're creating that all-important history tab, and that's what's going to give you a window into answering questions for your customers when they call in. 
The next place we want to go is to purchasing. So when we think about purchasing, we're thinking about everyone is a purchasing agent, uh, pretty much gotten us out of control, and what we want to see today is an automated process with some controls in place. So as we start through that process, we know today that you really um, are entering data multiple times. And we know that you don't have any approval process. So no one looks at what is being ordered. So there's no managerial approval. And it really doesn't help you when you go to that vendor to negotiate because you don't have any uh, details or anything to measure them by. So what you're going to see today is an automated process, much the same as you saw in the sales area. However, uh, we're going we're gonna to do this with some approvals, and we're also going to um, make sure that we are tracking the information so that we have vendor analysis and variance reporting. So let's take a look at that. So again, I'm going to start with the purchasing process map, and I'm going to walk through this verbally. However, <clears throat> to demo this, I am going to come over here to my employee user. So I've kept my employee user with the old interface. And, you know, this might be an opportunity for you to show them, you know, because you don't spend a lot of time in the employee section. This might be a good way to just say, you know, this is our old interface, and uh, we're going to pretend that we are Drew Jackson, our employee user. So think of this as one of your ADT locations outside of corporate. And we've structured Drew's permissions a little different. He has permission to go to Texas and Maine and transact in those two companies, and we've limited his access from an application perspective. So from a purchasing area, what I would suggest that you do is to enter a purchase requisition and save it in draft mode. So when you get ready to do your presentation, it's in draft mode. Then when you come in here, you can go into edit mode, and your transaction's already keyed. So as Drew, um, he doesn't have permissions to do purchase orders, but he can do recs. So he's entered a requisition, and he saved it as draft, and he's requisitioning some materials from Defender, and he does have an attachment here, and this is a, a place for you to talk about attachments, how they're used across the system, drag and drop, it can be pictures or documents. And once he is ready to go ahead and submit this, we have workflow approval turned on. This is going to go to Drew's manager. Now, when I hit this button, you're going to see something that you probably don't have turned on in your environment. I have the new application spend management turned on. You don't have to turn it on, but I'm just going to warn you that's what's going to happen to me. So when I submit it, it's going to come up and give me this message because I have that application subscribe to, and I also have this spend insight window now. So in, in other presentations, you may be using this, so that's why it's there. Don't need to talk about it. I'm going to go ahead and submit this purchase requisition. So submitting it means that you have the ability to, okay. Let's see, have I encountered a, a problem here that I can't get out of? Kind of looks that way. For some reason, not letting me out. Okay, I'll have to report that. Maybe something with the user interface is causing that problem, not sure. So let's take this one here that has been submitted. Always good to have another one in case something like that happens. So this one has been submitted, and this was just for a surveillance system. What happened in the background when I hit that submit, workflow approval kicked off an email to my manager, because that's the routing that I set up, 
And from that email, my manager could approve it if he or she was out of the office. This is where I come back to my dashboard and I come to my workflow approval dashboard. And on that dashboard, I have all of my approvals that are waiting for me to act on them. And here is a requisition waiting for me to approve it. I can either approve it or decline it, and I can approve it with comments. Once I've approved that, it's going to send an email message back to the requisitioner. So in this case, Drew Jackson would get a message back saying that I had approved his requisition. Once you've approved it, it's now moved to the next step in the process. So from here, I would talk about putting on your purchasing hat, and I would take that requisition, and I would convert it to the next step in the process, which is a purchase order. And I go through this section here pretty fast. So I'm converting it to a purchase order and sending it to Defender. Once Defender gets it, they pack it up and send it back to me. I'm going to go through a receiving process. So my warehouse person is going to receive it in. They're going to make sure they got the right item and the right quantity. And then a few days later, my accounting department is going to pick it up, and they are going to make sure that they got billed correctly. So in this case, that they got billed for $3,500, and they're also going to record a vendor document number. Once we've done that, we have gone from a requisition through approval all the way to vendor invoice, and we've recorded that in a history tab. So much the same as you saw on the sales side, we now have a history tab on the expense side that shows me every step of the process. So whether I'm talking to Drew or I'm talking to Defender, the vendor, I have information as to the purchase order, the shipping information, the receiving, and the vendor invoice. So I can answer any question that I need to directly from this history tab. If you'll notice on these history tabs, it is date, time, and user stamped. So you always have a great audit trail to know how these transactions were, um, were posted and keyed through the system. So now that we've looked at how we get those vendor invoices in, let's look at the information that we're now able to extract from gathering that and putting that onto a dashboard in purchasing. So now let's come back over to dashboard. Let's go into our purchasing operations dashboard. And again, I don't have to do a whole lot of talking here because I've already covered dashboards. But what I can show them is the different reports. So there's a vendor variance report to know when they are uh, either charging me differently or uh, sending me a different quantity. I'm tracking that now. I'm also able to track any exceptions. So when they tell me they're going to ship on a certain date, if they're late, I have a report that tracks that now. So these are some of the reports that you might want to have on that purchasing dashboard. So once you're done, you're going to come back here, go through your couple of minutes of this is what we showed you today. And then you're going to do a quick summary of what you covered. So in two minutes, you're going to say, so today we started with visibility and if you recall, we started out with dashboards. We showed you different types of dashboards, role-based dashboards that can be permissioned and can be viewed only. Uh, these dashboards contain real up-to-date information. You saw us drill down to the source transaction. And you can create as many of these dashboards as you choose to. The dashboards are fed by the flex reporting and impact. So the financial report writer is uh, creating reports uh, based on your requirements and showing those on the individual role-based dashboard. You can also take comfort in knowing that there's 120 standard on-demand reports from the subsystem, and those reports can also be pushed out to the dashboard and be viewed at any time. The second area that we looked at was 
customer service, and we went through a day in the life of a customer calling in and having questions about their sales order, about their shipping, or perhaps their invoice. Uh, also, at answering questions around their account and inventory quantity. We then looked at a role-based dashboard there that will help our sales management team. And then the third area that we looked at was purchasing. And we looked at a complete process from purchase requisition through approval all the way to vendor invoice. And then we looked at a purchasing dashboard that culminated all of our activities, giving us information about how our vendors are performing. You'll take comfort in knowing that many other companies like ADT are using Sage Intact to manage their growing businesses. In fact, we have over 15,000 companies using the solution today, from software to hospitality, healthcare to services, and pretty much everything in between. You'll also notice that uh, we are rated very high by the G2 crowd. G2 crowd is not an analyst. It is uh, an organization that tracks from the user's perspective how happy they are with the software solution. And we've won uh, many awards with G2 crowd. Before we leave today, I wanted to share a customer story that's a lot like the ADT story. The company that I worked with called Specialty Metals and Specialty Metals uh, based in Syracuse, New York. Uh, one of the things that they do is uh, they work a lot with specialty metals. So think about cold and hot work steel. Uh, if you're not familiar with that industry, it is, uh, it is one that's a little bit hard to track um, and provides a, a, a big part of the construction industry. So this is a, a wholesale distribution type of company. They have multiple locations, so important to have materials close to locations where it's needed. Uh, they were looking for a core accounting solution. And uh, like ADT, they're growing. They've got these multiple locations. They had a, systems in, in every location that were not connected, and they didn't, didn't have the ability to consolidate that data. One of the things that they also wanted was to make sure that whatever solution they chose, they would have uh, minimal disruption to their their day-to-day -day activities, and uh, that was very important to them. One of the things that I think is important to, to note here is they, too, were using QuickBooks, and they found this to be, you know, a real problem with visibility, with consolidation of data, which, you know, ADT has that same, uh, same uh, impact from having all these different QuickBooks instances. One of the things that they did was they looked for a system that not only uh, could address their remote offices, but one that, you know, could fit the criteria to where everyone could be um, self-sufficient, but part of a, a bigger picture. And one of the things that they did was they looked at the recommendations from the AICPA. And as you look at their comments here, you'll see that they feel like that really helped seal the deal was the recommendation from the AICPA. And if you're not familiar with that organization, that is the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And they have endorsed Intact for many years now. I've been at Intact for seven years and it was in place when I came on board. Uh, so they did their due diligence and we are the only cloud-based financial management solution that they do recommend. So it became a clear choice for specialty metals and I'm trusting that it will become a clear choice for ADT. In fact, uh, when we look to our customers today and interview them after they have joined the Intact family, 85% of our clients wish that they had switched sooner. Mm -hmm.